yes and no. I mean, there's a lot of teaching involved in religion. As a matter of fact, without teaching, we wouldn't know, wouldn't know who we were or where we were. Doctrine is teaching. Did you catch that? Teaching is doctrine. All right. Now, that's a lot to learn right there. A lot of people don't understand the, the similarities in the two, that they're, they're the same thing. But if you go to Exodus chapter 4, we'll start this lesson here in the fourth chapter of Exodus. Where God was calling Moses to go and confront Pharaoh. Moses at this point was 80 years old. He had left Egypt 40 years prior to this because he had committed a crime. His crime was killing an Egyptian in defense of an Israelite. He was doing what should have been done, but that was a crime, and so he had to flee for his life. Now, if you watch the movie The Ten Commandments with, with Charlton Heston and, and Yul Brynner, uh, it, it didn't happen the way it happened in the movie. Uh, Moses fled. He wasn't kicked out by Pharaoh. So we've got Moses has fled 40 years later after he's been a, a shepherd in the land of Midian for 40 years. God calls him and says, I want you to go down to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So here's a guy who's been a, a shepherd for 40 years and he's now 80 years old. And he's being told, I want you to go to Egypt and confront the most powerful man in the entire world. And you can imagine how Moses didn't want to do that. So Moses is giving up all these excuses. And one of his excuses is in verse, is in verse 10. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. It says, Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. In other words, I wouldn't know what to say. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then, go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth. Are you reading this? I will be with your mouth. And what does God say to him? I will teach you what you are to say. In other words, God is telling Moses, I'm going to indoctrinate you along the way. You'll be indoctrinated. You will be taught. You will know what you will need to say because I will be there to teach you what you need to say. Verse 13, but Moses said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Verse 14, the anger of the Lord burned against Moses and he said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you when he sees you and he will be glad in his heart. You were to speak to him and put these, put the words in his mouth and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Two times, God says to Moses, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to indoctrinate you. He says, I'm going to indoctrinate you on what you need to say. I'm going to indoctrinate you on what you need to do. What you say and what you do. See, that, to me, that pretty much covers it, doesn't it? Moses says, well, I don't know what to say when I go to Pharaoh. How will I act? How will I behave? And God says, don't worry about that. I'm going to teach you what to say. I'm going to teach you what to do. Without teaching, there is no doctrine. But doctrine isn't something that belongs to the church or to religion or to some group or to some concept. All doctrine is is teaching. God is a teacher. Are we listening to him? Are we allowing him to teach us? Somebody might say, oh, I don't believe in doctrine. I just believe in loving people. Okay? How do you know you're supposed to love people? Well, that's what Jesus taught us to do. If Jesus taught us to love, does that mean it's a doctrine? Is love a doctrine of Jesus Christ? Absolutely, it's a teaching of Jesus Christ. How do we know to love people? Well, I don't believe in doctrine. I just believe in serving people. Well, how do you know you're supposed to serve people? How do you know that's good? How do you know serving people is right and pleasing to God? Well, because Jesus taught us to serve. So if Jesus taught us to serve, does that mean service is a doctrine of Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. If we know we're supposed to love because Jesus taught us, then love becomes a doctrine of Christ. 
Now, I'm not trying to lower service and love to something less than what it is. I'm trying to get us to see that it's only by God teaching us, as he taught Moses, that we know how to say what needs to be said or the right thing to say. It's only by teaching that we know the right way to behave. And without his teaching, without doctrine, we're lost. We're floundering around like a, like a fish on the bank. If you go from Exodus to Deuteronomy chapter 6, this is what the law says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And somebody might say, oh, Marty, you're just talking about the old law. Yeah, we're talking about the old law. What was the old law? It was a tutor, a mentor, a teacher, a trainer, a guide to bring us to the new law. What does a teacher do but teach? What does a trainer do but train? They indoctrinate, if you will. They teach us. They give us everything we need to know, things we need to know to say, things we need to know to do. That's what the old covenant was. It was inspired of God to bring us to Christ. And so we're reading from Deuteronomy chapter 6 where it says this. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it so that your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I commanded you all the days of your life and that, uh, and that your days may be prolonged. What's that mean? That your days may be prolonged. That means God is saying, if you listen to my teachings and if you heed my teachings or if you keep my doctrines that I'm giving you, you will live longer. No, this is not a trick question. Do you want to live a good long life? And you can say amen to that. And you say, I don't know. He said it wasn't a trick question, but I think it's a trick question. It just sounds too obvious to me. I'm not going to say amen out loud because he's, he's going to. No, it's not a trick. God says, here's my teachings. Here's my commandments. You keep these, you'll live a long life. That's a pretty good deal. Verse 3, O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. What's the result of hearing, learning, and keeping the teachings or the doctrines of God? Long life, prosperity, health, your, your family will grow. Everything good comes from keeping the words of God. That's what God is telling Israel here in the first three verses of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 5, or verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Now I'm trying to think of a time there in verse 7 when it will not be appropriate or applicable to teach the Word of God. And I think that pretty much covers it. Teach them diligently, he says, to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. That pretty much covers all the time, doesn't it? So we're supposed to learn the teachings of God and then we are supposed to teach those teachings to our sons and our daughters and our grandsons and granddaughters. Keep it going right on down the line. Is doctrine important? You better believe it's important. When it comes right down to it, doctrine, hear me on this, is all we have. The teachings of God are all we have. If you don't believe that, go to, go to Judges. The last chapter of Judges, chapter 25, and we're going to read this last verse of Judges, and it's going to say something that's been said previously in Judges, chapter 17. It was said the same thing there in chapter 17 that it's saying in 25, but this is what it says. By the way, do you remember the history of Judges? The people were doing fine because God had blessed them. They kept his commandments. They gave up his commandments. They went into all kinds of uh, horrible situations. They were overtaken by their enemies, and then they prayed out to God. God would send them a deliverer, a judge. The judge would deliver them. Everything would be fine for a while. Then they'd give up the ways of God, uh, abandon his teachings, abandon his doctrines, go back into depravity, be overcome by their enemies. God would send them another judge over and over 
and over and over. If they had simply kept the teachings of God, the horrible things that we read about in the book of Judges never would have had to be written. But God wrote us about it, or write, wrote about those things and told us about them because they failed to keep his teaching. So when we get to the end of Judges, you would think by now everybody's learned their lesson, everybody's going to follow the Lord, but this is what it says. Chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right. Are you reading it? Is that what your translation says? What does your translation say? Everyone did what was right. Now, doesn't it say that? Mine says that in black and white. Oh, yours has a little bit more. Yours says in his own eyes. Does that make a difference? There was no king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. Have you ever noticed that people have different opinions about things? What do you think this means when it tells us everyone did what was right in his own eyes? That means there was no unity. What did Jesus pray for in John chapter 17? Just before he was, about, just before he was arrested and taken to be crucified, he prayed for the unity of his people. How did he pray for unity? He said, sanctify them in thy truth. Your word is truth. The only way we can be united as God's people is to pay attention to the doctrines. What are the doctrines? Those are the teachings of God. Without them, we flounder, we flail, and we do not know where we are going. But from Judges, go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah was one of God's prophets sent to Israel when, when Israel was floundering and flailing like a fish. They'd, they'd given up on God and they were worshiping idols. They didn't know what they were doing. Jeremiah taunted them more or less at one point. He said, you, you go out in the woods and you cut down a piece of a tree and you take part of that tree and you use it to cook your fire, to cook your field. You take another part of that tree and you carve it into a God and you bow down and worship that God. How dumb is that? Essentially is what Jeremiah is saying. We can see that. Why didn't they see that? Here's why. One of the reasons why they didn't see it. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. Jeremiah says, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. What's that tell us? What does that tell you and what does it tell me? That tells us that if we're looking for teaching that's true, that's right, that's wholesome, that's good, that'll lead us to God, don't look within ourselves. Look to God for that, because it is not in us to direct our own way. Why are there so many religions in the world today? People don't stick with the doctrines of God. They get away from them, and all kinds of religious uh, groups, organizations spring up. Staying in Jeremiah, just go over a little bit to chapter 17. Jeremiah says this in chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. This is what Don read for us just a minute ago. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds." The heart is deceitful. If I'm looking to practice truth, to know truth, to understand truth, to teach truth to others, I can't look in myself. I have to look to something else, and that something else is the Word of God. Because my heart and your heart, they're both sick. They're desperately wicked. Here's how that works. You want to lose a little weight, so you're giving up certain foods. But your heart says... It's just one cookie. One cookie won't hurt anybody. One cookie won't wreck your diet. And so you, you think, okay, yeah, one cook, one cookie. I'll just have one cookie. And so you eat a cookie. Then your heart says to you, your heart that told you just one cookie is all it is, don't worry about that. Then your heart says to you, you've already eaten one. 
you might as well have two. If you could walk those off in a mile, two cookies is not a big deal. And so you eat the second cookie. And then your heart says to you, you stupid, you've already eaten two cookies. You might as well eat three in a whole bag. I mean, you've already ruined your diet. Tell me it doesn't work like that. Tell me that's not the truth. Our hearts are desperately sick. They're wicked. They only know to seek their own. And so when we look to ourselves for doctrine, for teaching, for truth, we're going to fail. We're going to come up with something dumb because it's going to be according to our own will and not the will of God. God's the only one who knows what's right. And here's the thing that's so hard for us to understand. He's the only one who really knows what's good for you and good for me. How much time do we waste in our lives telling ourselves, I'm the one who knows what's best for me? And God says, no, you don't. Your heart is desperately sick. You're weak and you're wicked. Let me help you with this. I'm going to lead you someplace, and when you get there, you won't believe how wonderful it is. But you can't get there on your own because the way of man is not in himself. It's just not there. Talking about teaching, look at the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. Probably everybody in here is somewhat familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. You probably have at least heard of the Sermon on the Mount. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. Now, if Jesus is teaching them, what would you call what he taught them but doctrine? You read the Sermon on the Mount. Well, what kind of stuff is in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to find out that the first thing Jesus deals with is attitudes. If you've got a, an attitude that you're poor in spirit, you're going to be blessed. In other words, you're not trying to dominate everything. You're poor and you're thinking, I, I need to humble myself and, and learn some things perhaps. Or if you are a person who is mournful of things that are wrong and things that are bad, something bad happens and you mourn over that. Somebody's in pain and you mourn over that. You've got empathy and sympathy, those kinds of compassionate feelings for others. Somebody who's gentle is what Jesus teaches us about here. Somebody who is hungry and thirsting for righteousness. Somebody who is merciful in their behavior towards others. Have you ever needed mercy from someone and been so glad to get it? Somebody who's, whose life is pure. That's what he's teaching us about here. Somebody who is a peacemaker. Those are the first kinds of things that he teaches us about in the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm asking you, are these things just teachings or are these doctrines of Almighty God? Oh, we call them doctrines. Oh, that makes them sound too official. No, they're just teachings of God. That's all they are. What else does Jesus talk about in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, he talks about reconciliation. If you've got something wrong between you and your brother, go to your brother and get that fixed. Be reconciled to your brother. He talks about faithfulness of marriage. He talks about integrity. Let your yea be yea and your no be no. He talks about second mile living. Somebody compels you to go one mile, you gladly volunteer to go a second mile. That's what we're talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. Teachings of Jesus, yes. Doctrines of Jesus, yes. They're the same thing. They're the same thing. Somebody says, oh, I think we should just love everybody. Just love everybody, and we might say it that way, like love is just kind of a mushy thing. Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount to love our enemies. There's nothing much mushy about loving our enemies, amen? That requires strength, that requires courage, that requires conviction, that requires faith. But Jesus says of loving our enemies, that's the very thing that makes us like God. What did God do but love his enemies? He loved us when we were enemies, sent his son when we were enemies. It's a teaching of God, therefore it is a doctrine of God. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this. This is still a Sermon on the Mount, by the way. Last part of the Sermon on the Mount, but it's Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What's required of us to get into the kingdom? According to this, doing the will of God. If we're going to do the will of God, doesn't that mean we're going to have to know the will of God? Does that make sense to you? Seems to make sense to me. You have to know the will of God before you can do the will of God. I want to go to heaven. How about you? I, I'm ready to go to heaven. And, you know, the old joke about somebody says, who wants to go to heaven? And everybody stands up, and one guy in the back said, how come you're not standing up? said, well, I thought you were getting up a load for today. We all want to go to heaven. We want to be with God. We want to receive an eternal reward. And Jesus says, if you want that eternal reward, it's going to come down to this. It's going to come down to doctrine. Don't ever minimize doctrine. It's going to come down to doctrine is what I'm saying because that's what Jesus is saying. We have to do the will of God. Not perfectly. Nobody's perfect, but faithfully. There's a difference between being perfect and being faithful. I like to use the illustration about a husband. I'm a husband. I can be a faithful husband, but I can't be a perfect husband. I'm glad God teaches us to be faithful in our marriages, not to be perfect. Amen? And he teaches us to be faithful in our relationship with him, not to be perfect in the sense that we are without sin. But the only way to know the will of God is to study. Like Paul told Timothy, study for what purpose? To show himself approved of God. A man who knew the word was able to rightly divide it. Don't ever let anybody, especially yourself, because remember, your heart's deceitfully wicked. Your heart may be telling you, you don't need to know the Bible. You're not a preacher. Leave that to the preachers. Leave that to Mike and Marty. Leave that to, to the elders. Leave that knowing the Bible stuff to people who have to teach. I'm not a teacher. I'm just eating cookies. Your heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful, and it will not lead you in the way of God. You have to use your mind, your head, Use the brain that God gave you and the good judgment and logic that you have. And the more you use that, the more you exercise that, the stronger it will become. And if you exercise it in the ways of God, it'll be stronger in the way of God. You'll know the will of God, you'll be able to do it, and you'll be all right. One of the things, or three of the things rather, about doctrine that I want to bring up is why we have issues with doctrine. And what I was just talking about is the first issue we have. It requires work. It requires work. You've got to do something in order to learn the doctrine, to learn the teaching. Sometimes you've got to dig. This book, Muscle and the Shovel, I don't know about you, but when I heard that title, I thought, what kind of a goofy title is that for a book about the gospel? And the guy explains it. I think it's on page 183 or something like that. But Michael Shank is the guy who wrote it, and he said, I, I title it Muscle and a Shovel because if you want to know the truth about the Word of God, You've got to exercise some spiritual muscle. You've got to exercise a spiritual shovel. You've got to do some digging. It may not come easy. You've got to put some effort into it, and that's what he had to do, and that's why he named the book Muscle and a Shovel. And that's one of the reasons why not more people are familiar with the real teachings of Scripture because it takes work to acquire that knowledge. Number two. Doctrine requires discipline and self-denial to follow. Jesus teaches us love our enemies. How are we going to do that? Well, it's going to be tough. Because what we're going to want to do about our enemies is very different from what we're supposed to do towards our enemies. And it's not about a feeling. It's not about feeling all lovey-dovey towards anybody. It's about doing the right thing towards other people that you may consider your enemies. Do those things that are loving and you will be loving agape love is not about a feeling agape love is about action do you do those things that demonstrate love and that's what jesus is teaching us to do and that's what it requires so two things so far doctrine is is, a, is an issue in some people's minds because it requires work to learn the doctrines to learn the teachings and also because it requires discipline and self-denial to keep those teachings. Number three, and here perhaps is the toughest one in today's culture. Doctrine compels us to exclude those who do not conform to the doctrines of Scripture. Are the teachings of Christ exclusive 
Jesus is the one who said, by the way, he said it in the Sermon on the Mount. There are two ways. One is narrow and straight, and it leads to eternal life. The other is broad and wide, and it leads to destruction. When we set ourselves on the narrow way, that excludes every teaching and every practice that has to do with the broad way. And those teachings and those practices, well, for example, do you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God to be a Christian? That's a Christian teaching, which makes it a Christian doctrine, which means that everybody in the world, everybody in the world who does not believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God is lost. Ooh, Marty. Can you say that? Well, it doesn't matter if I say it or not. It's the truth. <laughs> it's the absolute truth. What about other things? What about moral issues like abortion? If it weren't for the scriptures, if it wasn't for the word of God, would we really know what he thought about abortion? I've even heard people argue, oh, abortion's not murder because uh, the Bible says that man became a living soul when he took his first breath, when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so your baby is not really a living person until they come out of the womb and take their first breath of life. I've heard people use that reasoning, that argument. I thought, Pfft. how would you know better than that except for the teachings of God? How would you know better than that unless you're able to apply, well, when... When Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John the Baptist, came in to where Mary was, John's little cousin who was just recently conceived by the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist, six months old in his mother's womb, not six months old being born, but six months old in his mother's womb, Scripture says leaped for joy inside his mouth. I wonder how that felt to Elizabeth. Man, this baby's going crazy in me. Why is he going crazy? Because... Somehow that little infant inside his mother's womb, little John the Baptist knew that he was in the presence of his Savior Jesus Christ. Mary was there and John knew. That's what the scriptures teach us about the potential of an infant in the womb. What do other scriptures, all oh, that Jeremiah was told that I knew you before you were born. David says the same thing. You were there when I was knit in my mother's womb. We know what the scriptures teach and so we know what to believe. We know what to practice. We know what to do. What about, uh, what have I got down here? All men are men. And you might think, well, that's kind of an odd statement. It wouldn't have been an odd statement 150 years ago when some men were considered less than men. All men are men regardless of skin color. How would I know that to be true unless it wasn't for the scriptures? Somebody could tell me, oh, these, these other people, different color than you are, Marty. Well, they're not the same race, and so they are less than you are. You know why so many, and I'm, I'm not trying to denigrate any particular people, but you know why some of the Native American peoples fought with each other? Because they thought that other tribes were less than they were as human beings. How do we know different unless we go to the Scriptures and rightly divide what the Scriptures say? How do we know that the practice of homosexuality is wrong? Well, okay, you can say that nature teaches you that, and I'll agree with you. <laughs> but when it comes down to today's culture, how hard would it be if we could not go back to Scripture and say, this is what God says about it, and this is why I know it's wrong? How difficult would that be without that kind of guidance and leadership from God? Is that a doctrine? Absolutely, it's a doctrine, because it's a teaching of God. And how do I know right from wrong unless I go back to those teachings? How do I know I'm supposed to be faithful to my wife except for the word of God? How do I know I'm supposed to be a good father to my children and train them and teach them except it be for the word of God? How would I know any of these things? And how would I be able to protect myself from the crazy ideas of religion that come up in this world? How would I have known that I should not have been part of the Inquisition back when the Inquisition was being held? You know what the Inquisition is? That's when people were being tortured by people who claimed to be God's church in order to make them confess sin. I don't read much about that in the Bible, but there was a time when people thought that was the right way to go. How many of you remember Jim Jones? 914 people went with him down to British Guiana, and 914 people either drank the Kool-Aid laced with poison. If they didn't drink it, they were shot. 
How would I know not to follow somebody like Jim Jones? How about those feet people that you hear about on the news from time to time who refuse medical help because they say, we're not going to allow a doctor to see my child because we're going to pray to God. Should you pray to God when your child's sick? Absolutely, on the way to the doctor. Pray to God and do everything you can within your power to get help, medical help. How about, did you hear about this guy, was it last week, died from a snake bite? People still handle snakes and people still buy from being bitten by, or die from being bitten by snakes. How would you know not to be involved in something like that except for scripture? Doctrine, it's important. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, I can't express to you enough how important doctrine is because all doctrine is is teaching. And if we haven't been taught right, we'll never be able to think right. We'll never be able to act right. And if we haven't been taught right, we'll never make it to heaven. Everything depends on doctrine. Everything. Agreed? Any amens? If you disagree, hey, that's fine. Talk to me later. I want to talk to you about that. But right now, we're going to bring this sermon to a conclusion. And I want, I want to teach you something very quickly that the scriptures teach us. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you repent of your sin and confess his name before others and let somebody bury you in baptism, you'll be saved. That's the simple plan of salvation. How do I know that? Because it's taught in the scriptures. Is that a doctrine of God? Absolutely, it's a doctrine of God. Anything and everything else won't get it done. But that'll get it done. If you want to obey that doctrine or if there's prayers of the church that you need, whatever it might be, we're going to sing this song of encouragement and invite you to come forward and let us know how we can help you. Let's stand and sing.